Lauren or Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our what I like to think of as our back to school webinar. I don't know about you, but I have my notebook and pen ready to go looking to learn tonight. My name is Beth Keen, and I am the community chair of the Heart Health and Wellness Council at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Our council is one of eight councils that make up the community collaborative. And the community collaborative is a bunch of hardworking people, both from within the hospital and from within the community, working to meet the needs of the diverse communities we serve at the hospital. Tonight, I have the pleasure of um, introducing Dr. Joseph Kavidar, who is going to teach us about wearables and their corresponding apps for monitoring and optimizing our own health at home. Dr. Kavidar is a professor at Harvard Medical School, and he is senior advisor of the Mass General Center for Innovation in Digital Healthcare. Among his many accomplishments, he is also the author of two books on digital health, The Internet of Healthy Things and The New Mobile Age, How Technology Will Extend the Health Span and Optimize the Lifespan. Uh, at the end of our talk tonight, we will leave ample time for question and answer. So please feel free to use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen to pose any questions you might have. Off to you, Dr. Kavidar. Thank you, Beth. And, and thanks so much for inviting me to talk about one of my uh, topics that I've been passionate about for, I don't know, the last 15 years or so, which is wearables and apps and sickness and health. And I guess I'll start out with just a little vignette about my own experience, which uh, I, I learned maybe the hard way about, which is that I, I happen to be a person who is very motivated by numbers, uh, uh, by by sort of tracking my progress and various endeavors, by being able to to manage. I'm, I'm maybe the poster child for the phrase, you you can only manage what you measure. Uh, so back in about 2008, we, when I had this group called the Center for Connected Health, we were working with a fam, uh, with sorry, with an in innovator who had a little <clears throat> uh, dot-sized device that you could clip on your shoe, measure your steps, and then transmit it to a screen where you could view your own activity. And I, I thought that was. Uh, just mind boggling. I was, I was all set. And, and I learned for the first thing I learned was how inactive I was. Uh, and then after that started thinking about how it could increase my, my activity and really some, some really interesting insights like raking leaves is, is pretty intense work. Th things that I would hate doing, I realized later were uh, perhaps good for me. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is the fact that uh, not everyone's like me. What a surprise. And the vast majority of folks out there don't give a hoot about numbers and don't necessarily care about being uh, as maybe uh, excited as I was about self-tracking. So we're going to try to unpack that. And what, what it leads to is this notion of that there must be a secret, right? There's, there's an answer to a secret here, which is how, why is it that some wearables get get uh, stuck in a drawer after six weeks, and why is it that some people relish in these activities? So the answer to the secret, and I I love the Wizard of Oz. It's one of my favorite movies for for all kinds of reasons, but one major reason is because the four people pictured here are the four characters, all had the wizard tell them that something they wanted desperately was already inside them. And that's really the answer to this wearables uh, conundrum, which is you have to match the information that's coming out of that device with what motivates you, how you're motivated to change your behavior. And we'll talk more about that. So again, what we're gonna cover in the next 30 minutes or so is wearables in the context of motivation and then wearables for chronic illness management. and there's some overlap, which is kind of fun. Uh, a device like the Apple Watch can be used in both of these contexts. Um, and, and so that's kind of fun. But but really, they're, I would say, 
intellectually different spheres uh, of thought. Now, I want to start off by just reminding you all with something you probably none of none of your audience members need to be reminded of. But there's a couple of new findings from the literature that I just couldn't resist sharing with you. So this is basic kind of table stakes. And I love the quote from Hippocrates, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have the safest way to health. That's guys over 2000 years ago. So this is a concept that that uh, activity is good for you is, is not exactly new. And the curve here is really just an homage to the num numerous studies showing that if you're more active, you can be healthier, generally speaking. So again, <clears throat> not news. Maybe interesting to think about the fact that we've been people have been saying this for two thousand years. But really not news. This, however, is, and and I'm I'm I show this with a little bit of trepidation uh, because it's a complicated graph from a research paper. And I don't want anyone in the audience to think that I'm going to take you down this kind of geeky rabbit hole of multiple things from scientific papers. So fear not, we'll go over this one, we'll make it straightforward. Um, and then this will be the mo by far the most complicated slide that I show you. So stick with me, and I'm going to explain it. The concept here, uh, which is re fairly recent in the literature, is that not just physical activity, but relatively short, and I'm talking one to two minutes, bursts of activity during a day can dramatically affect human mortality. So the way these graphs work is on the left-hand side of all of them is HR, which means hazard ratio. That is the likelihood that someone in this particular study would die. So, and that's, you know, one is you're going to die. 0.5 is you have a 50% less chance of dying than if, if you didn't do the behavior. And the top two are about... And sorry, the whole thing is about this idea of short bursts of activity. And I don't remember exactly what VIPL stands for, but essentially what it stands for is something like stepping up on a chair, backing up, up and down for a minute, or walking up a flight of stairs. I mean, these are not what you would think of as exceptionally uh, complex or, or winded activities. And and the top, you have the duration, the number of times, or sorry, the total number of time in a day that you did those activities, one to one to two minute burst on the left hand side is one minute, the right hand side is two minutes. And you can see that the curve at about five or six uh, shows about a 50% drop. So just by doing maybe a, a flight of stairs five or six times a day, you can 50% have your mortality. The bottom is the frequency with which you do them during a day. Same concept, more frequent, but not by much. You don't have to be anything approaching uh, a marathoner to get these benefits. And that's what I wanted to share with you. And, and I probably uh, out, outweighed my welcome by doing it. But it's a little more specifically stated in this editorial from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And by the way, we are going to share slides and all these slides have references if you really are excited to dig into some of this stuff on a more granular detail. So the first two bullets here, of course, I think most of you will probably know that 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate activity is helpful, 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous. I, I expect that if you took the bother of spending your Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. listening to me talk about this. You already know that. What I think might be news to us is that short bursts of two to three minute uh, activities a few times a day have a dramatic effect on mortality. So I wanted to share that because, again, we're going to talk about wearables. We're going to talk about activity. We're going to talk about the fact that everyone's life is busy and you've got a million things to do. How are you going to carve out time to be active? And the point of this is you don't need to carve out that much time. 
The other thing that I want to talk about is sleep. Uh, and I will just say this, that it's one thing to count steps. And yes, if you uh, happen to have a Fitbit and an Apple Watch and maybe your mobile phone in your pocket and uh, Aura Ring, you'll notice that they all have a slightly different step count. So, you know, one thing to take home from this is that accuracy per se is not necessarily the holy grail because each one of them is consistent from within. So if you decide that I really like the Fitbit, uh, as long as you stick with it, because 7,000 steps on your Fitbit versus 9,000 will be consistent day after day. Sleep is a little harder. I mention it because it's so important and we all know it's important, but as a matter of fact, it's hard for these devices to track sleep. What they will do is they have software algorithms that will take into account uh, how still your body is at night. Uh, they'll take into account your sometimes your breathing rhythm, but certainly your heart rate, because it's easy for all these devices to measure heart rate. So if you're lying really still and have a low heart rate, you're probably having a deep sleep. Uh, you'll have a slightly different heart rate when you're having uh, REM sleep or dreaming, et cetera. There are approximations. And I just mentioned that because so many people now are trying to rely on these things to predict sleep. And I think they're, we're, we're uh, quite a bit farther away from reality on sleep than we are on something like activity and step counts. So having quickly covered the fact that yes, it's important for you to be active. It's important for you to get a good night's sleep. Again, no news flash I know for this audience. How can wearables help with that? And we're really gonna talk about two uh, benefits of wearables uh, and one not. So I think the not one is just as important as the two. On the one hand, we're gonna talk about tracking for motivated individuals. And the other hand, chronic disease management. Now, as you know from the bottom of the slide, it's not useful for you to give an unmotivated individual a tracker of any sort and expect them to somehow magically become motivated. It, it's just not the way they're programmed. And I have, as I said, in my own experience, I thought we had unlocked the secret to not only chronic illness management, but population health when I started tracking. And we started doing some studies. Again, this goes back 15 years. And we learned, I learned the hard way that so many people are not wired the way I am, and they don't give a hoot about numbers. They have other priorities in life. So once again, the secret to unlocking the value of these wearables is about the motivation. Just quickly, and I have to say quickly because we are time limited. Uh, I, these, this is from a paper that I'm going to reference off, and you'll see the source at the bottom. It's a large review from the annuals, uh, sorry, the annals of uh, um, re annual review of medicine, sorry, 2021 by a group from uh, UPenn that is really quite expert in this whole topic. And so if, if anyone really wants to drill deeper, that's a very good resource. Um, and this is one of the tables from, from their review. And again, I don't know all of these. I don't know what motive ring is. I've not experienced with it. I don't really know what the Zephyr is. You can go down the list. The point is that there's, I think the most action is in the wrist, right? There's a cutesy phrase out there that the wrist is the next battleground for technology because if you're wearing an Apple watch, you're probably not gonna put a Fitbit on your arm. Or maybe you will if you're, really geeky, but most people won't. And so these companies are after that that real estate, your wrist. Um, the Muse is an interesting one, is it's a headband. I think one of the other themes about all this is that the, the Muse measures electroencephalogram, which is a pretty complex concept. It's brain activity. But what they do is they turn it into a way for you to meditate. And I think that's what's clever about some of these wearables companies, that they take a physiologic signal that would otherwise be either boring or arcane, and they turn it into something very useful. 
So Muse is a headband for, for meditation. Aura Ring is very popular for things like uh, tracking uh, uh, fertility and, and some other uh, uh, issues or, or rather uh, instances. Um, but the wrist is where I think a lot of this is. So the, and the two big players there are Apple Watch and Fitbit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Apple Watch when I get to the chronic illness management part of, of the discussion. There are some chest worn uh, things that, uh, you know, these patches or t-shirts or whatever. I think they're, they're just a little clumsy. They have limited value, uh, but they are out there. Uh, there are some belts. Uh, and then there are things you can, like socks, you can pull up on your legs. Each one of these has sensors embedded in them. The sensors typically communicate via the same technology that you use to match uh, your earbuds or what have you called Bluetooth. And then it'll show up on your smartphone as some sort of uh, tracking of your activity. So that's great. But once again, if if you don't care uh, or you're not motivated by the numbers, then your stuff's going to wind up in the drawer. So I'm going to just share a few. Again, these are all high level. I, I don't have the time to drill into this, but I did write a book, as as Beth mentioned, in 2015. So it's it's an interesting to go back and, and just paw through it because so much of it has come true now. At the time, a lot of it was speculation called uh, the Internet of Healthy Things. And we talk quite a bit about this notion of you have to be motivated uh, to succeed here. And this this is a uh, snapshot from one of the chapters uh, in that book. Some of this is maybe less relevant to you as an individual, to be quite candid, and more relevant to uh, someone who's trying to motivate a population of individuals. But let's just quickly go through these uh, three strategies and, and three tactics. So make it about life just means that you should design whatever motivation you're designing so that the person on the other end feels like it's very much fits into their life. Nobody really, really, nobody wants to stop, put down what they're doing and do their physical activity. Or it's rare, right? Again, if you're motivated to go to the gym three or four times a week, you're probably not needing a wearable, quite frankly, uh, because you're already motivated. But most of us have, a, you know, kids or a life or what have you. We're busy. We have job stress. So the idea that you can fit your motivation into something you're doing. The second is really important, personalization. And these days, this is like table stakes for any app. And I'm going to show you a list of apps in a minute. Uh, but basically, they have to make you feel like you're unique and you're special, and they do that by asking you a series of questions or by things like the Netflix where, you know, people like you watch this movie, that kind of thing. Those are all personalization tools. Social connections is a really important one. I, um, I'm a dermatologist by training, and uh, when I see, excuse me, patients in my office with something on their wrist, I typically ask them why, and so many times it's their I'm in a competition with a loved one. I'm in a competition with my husband or my spouse or what what have you. So social is really important for this stuff. And it doesn't have to be one-to-one -one social. It could be you're part of a group that's all tracking. You know, there were these uh, uh, workplace apps for a while where everyone could get in the same team and compete on losing weight with others. These are, for most people anyway, and, and that's the key is not everyone, but for most people, those are powerful stimuli. The tactics, again, are a little bit more about designing. So for someone who's designing an app, uh, the Sentinel effect is one I want to call out for you because that's something we should all be aware of, which is the phenomenon that if you are being, if you know you are being watched by someone that you care about, like your doctor or your spouse or your mom, that kind of thing, you will behave differently. It's a known psychological fact that almost all of us, unless you're a sociopathic personality and don't care. For most of us, though, we really care about the fact that we're behaving for that individual because we want to look good in front of them. So that's a powerful tool. I think that's similar to the, to the uh, social connections, right? It's a powerful tool 
for behavior change. And we saw it over and over again over the years that if patients knew that their doctor was paying attention to these patient-generated data, they upped their gain because they wanted to be uh, um, looking good. For the, and it didn't have to be the doctor too. It could be a nurse in their practice, et, et cetera. So I, I will call your attention to that one uh, as well. This is just, I, I picked this literally off the internet. Uh, this is a fact that these are the 10 most downloaded health apps um, and the down, most downloaded fitness apps. I, I don't endorse any of these. Uh, you're, again, you're gonna get these slides if you want them, you're welcome to paw through them. The key is finding ones that resonate with you. And I know I keep saying that, but it's really important that you're self-aware in that regard because otherwise it's a big waste of your money and time. Here are some popular ones. This again comes from that same review I mentioned earlier where I had the chart of the wearables. So Walker, and, and you'll see some themes here. So Walker is a game that requires you to walk to make progress. In other words, gamification is a real popular tool for motivating people, whether it's leaderboards or being announced that you're uh, in the lead or uh, being reminded that, you know, and, and I'm a, right now I'm learning a language using Duolingo. They use every gamification tool known to man to remind me on a daily basis to, uh, to get involved, whether it's streaks or any of that. So that's Walker, fitness pets. If you like animals, you can create a virtual pet. And if you don't do your walking, they die. And oh my God, I better feed my virtual, like a Tamagotchi. If you're in my age group, you might remember that. Um, Achievement, that's an interesting one. Get paid to work out. Obviously, you've got to put money in or your employer does. And, and we'll say a little bit more, perhaps, if we have time about social, uh, uh, sorry, about financial incentives. Financial incentives are good up front. Usually, they they trail off over time. Uh, and and they have a this, this uh, uncomfortable uh, um, notion that, you want more and more. So whoever's giving the financial incentive will soon run out of money and it's not a pretty picture. Um, here's another game, Fitness RPG. Your steps are converted to energy that powers a superhero. There's another one out there, I don't remember the name of it, where you're, you're running to, to prevent being gobbled up by a goblin. I mean, people have all kinds of ways that they get excited about this stuff and each one of us is different. Um, so that's, again, my, my, my message to all of you. These are some that have been carefully studied. This is the same group from Penn. Their expertise is in something called behavioral economics, which I don't know how familiar folks are with that, but it's basically the notion that we behave with a series of biases. For instance, uh, if, if, if you walk into a cafeteria and all of the healthy drinks are at eye level, population-wise, we're more likely to purchase healthy drinks because we're kind of lazy and that's what it's at eye level. Uh, if you go into the store, the, the as you probably know, people pay a lot of money for their products to be at eye level for the same reason. So that's behavioral economics. Uh, so make rewards a tangible and in a familiar context. This is a TRIPA trial uh, and cash is compelling on a short-term basis, as I said earlier. Uh, social in, uh, incentive gamification. Um, once again, the, the, this particular study, the people that had a gamification app did better than those who did not. And this whole interesting of lost framed incentives. So the idea that you might put down, I don't know, $100 into your account. And if you don't exercise, it goes away. That seems to be a much more powerful incentive to change behavior than saying, if you do exercise, we'll pay you 10 bucks. Just interesting. It's the same amount of money, but somehow losing it is more powerful. So these are mental games that we all can play with ourselves. And once again, uh, now I want to just share two uh, examples of this from the corporate world before I go on to the chronic illness management part. These, This one I know is for sure in use. I don't know. I'm going to share the one, something called Walgreens Balance Rewards in a minute. It was, uh, I don't use the Walgreens app, so I don't know if it's still 
uh, in use, but uh, I can share the story at any rate. So United Healthcare Motion came about out of a skunk works at United Healthcare. For those who maybe are not familiar, United Healthcare is a, the largest health insurer in the country. And of course, they therefore they a lot of employers will hire them to manage their uh, health benefits. So this program that I'm going to describe to you is available as a health benefit for what they call health uh, plan sponsors, meaning companies that might employ you who hire United Healthcare to manage their healthcare benefits. And the way this works, it's kind of fascinating. So it started out with a proprietary wearable, uh, I don't know, maybe six or eight years ago. After a couple of years, they switched over to Apple Watch, Fitbit, whatever you like. Um, and you can get $4 a day into your health savings account. It's the, the algorithm is called Fit uh, Frequency, Intensity, and Tenacity. Frequency is get out of your chair once uh, an hour and walk around. You don't have to walk more than 15 steps for that one. Uh, intensity is a, a, a brisk 30 minute walk on a given day. And tenacity is your 10,000 steps. Each one of those is worth a dollar in your health savings account. If you do all three, you get an extra buck. And this is offered by United Healthcare as a benefit to certain clients. I don't know how widespread it is, how popular it is, but it's out there and it's just interesting to me to think about the psychology. Walgreens is a slightly different package and you can see the data here, which I think is quite compelling. So the idea here is that you can link your Walgreens app with your tracker. I, back in the day when I studied this, it was Fitbit. I'm pretty sure they do it now with Apple Watch as well. And if you're active, you can create in the Walgreens app coupons that you can use in Walgreens, of course, for healthy purchases. So there's, again, a financial component to it. And you can see the status, uh, uh, sorry, the data here. 29% of people who did this lost 10 pounds or more. 5% improved adherence to their statin drugs. 6% improved adherence to their anti-diabetic drugs. And lest you think that those are small numbers, when you take a huge population, if you're an employer, five or 6% moving the needle, that's a lot of dollars. So I think these are interesting. As I said earlier, financial incentives, I think burn out fairly quickly, but I wanted to give you a sense that this is not just kind of theoretical and this and that, that the, the actual science behind this has been put into, into work in the corporate world. So that's the bit on uh, wearables. And, and and motivation. And I hope you take away from that, that you can't do much unless you have the two synchronized. Now, chronic illness management is slightly different. I mean, they're related, but, uh, and I'm somehow stuck on my, here we are. So they're related, but the notion here is that your doctor's involved. So that sentinel effect that I mentioned comes into play right away. If you're, it's one thing if you're going out to get a Fitbit and you want to track your steps and maybe compete with your spouse. It's another thing if your doctor says, I want to track your blood pressure. Here's what you need to do. Most people respond to that a little differently than their own, um, you know, family uh, dynamics. So these are four examples. There, there are others. There's this whole burgeoning area of digital therapeutics. There's a uh, so much going on in the space of uh, uh, remote patient monitoring. I'm going to just hit the highlights here. Again, we only have uh, a small amount of time, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time for, for discussion. So we're going to cover all of these things. Uh, I think one of the most interesting, and I'll spend a little bit more time on it, is the first one, the Apple Watch and atrial fibrillation. Uh, so let me just... Uh, talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation for the uninitiated. This is a condition where the um, top chambers in your heart, the atria specifically, uh, they don't pump in synchrony like the rest of your heart, but they sort of just flop like that and vibrate. And that's not effective for pumping. But more importantly, when you have that, it's likely that you'll get a blood clot by there 
And when if you get a blood clot by there and it dislodges, it can go into your brain and you can have a stroke and nobody wants that. So atrial fibrillation is really common and it's a big deal. The other thing about it that makes it challenging is that it is intermittent in many cases, meaning I could sense palpitations now and I could go to the emergency room because I'm worried about it. And when I got there, my heart rate is normal. And they look at me and say, your EKG is normal, go home. So that creates a lot of anxiety, both on the doctor and the patient's side. And for years, it was that. It was like, we're trying to get, and we, you could wear something called a Holter monitor, or now there's a version called a Zeo patch. You wear it for a couple of weeks and they record your rhythm. But, but in essence, you have to kind of catch when your heart's going off. So Apple created this tool with the Apple Watch, and it's not news anymore. Perhaps some of you are aware of it. And it works two ways. One is the Apple Watch itself can sense when there's a rhythm abnormality and send a message to your doctor. So that's one. The other is if you're feeling palpitations in your chest, you can push a button on your watch and record, as is shown here in this picture, a rhythm strip. Now that happens to be normal rhythm in the picture, but if it's atrial fibrillation, it will show up and you can send that to your doctor. And that can help again with this elusive diagnosis that has real consequences, like who wants to have a stroke? So this was studied in 2019, and the, the references here was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a pretty high-end journal. And I'm, I, I would not spend my time, if I were you, trying to read this chart. It's, it's simply put in for visual impact that the study is worth looking at. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is several things. One is this, this study was uh, unusual and, and innovative in that they recruited everybody online. So that's a little bit of an aside that, that they used uh, tools like Facebook and uh, Apple itself to, to recruit people. So they had a very large sample, as you can see, 295,000. That's a top right-hand uh, bold there. Um, of those people, uh, 929 actually had a notification that they might have an abnormal heart rate. And of those, about half actually did. So I, again, this is just interesting that, yes, you can get false positives. You know, you might drive your doctor crazy depending on who your doctor is and how she operates. But there's potential value here in a consumer device. And I just love the fact that there's this crossover between the same device that you get text messages on and all this, and, and yet it can be used in a medical uh, uh, context. So these are the conclusions from the Apple Heart Study. The probability of receiving an irregular pulse notification was low. That's a good thing because who wants a lot of false positives, particularly if you're on the other end of receiving these things. Among participants who received a notification of a regular pulse, 34% had atrial fibrillation. Again, that's pretty good. This is an elusive diagnosis. Um, and 84% of the notifications were concordant with, that's again, pretty good. Um, and then there's a little bullet here about the fact that this was an innovative uh, clinical trial design because everyone was recruited uh, online, something that we probably don't need to drill in today. So that's, again, one of my favorites uh, for, for this whole notion of chronic illness management. I'm going to cover a couple of others, then we'll wrap up and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. The second one is congestive heart failure. Now, this goes all the way over to the other side of the spectrum. Earlier, we talked about managing steps and sleep and all these sort of healthy activities. Congestive heart failure is a real disease. And, and I know so is the other things, but man, people with congestive heart failure, a lot of times are uh, homebound, you know, they're short of breath easily, and they wind up in the hospital a lot. So this particular study that's illustrated here was designed to use the, the uh, what you see in the cartoon, a weight scale, a blood pressure cuff, and a tabletop computer, which nowadays could be your smartphone or a tablet. This was done probably 15 years ago to look at the possibility of caring for those people in their home 
and not bringing them into the hospital. This was done with a nurse call center and this technology and a dashboard that the nurses could use to, um, to uh, choose which patients they should be managing. So there's a one-to-many aspect of this. One nurse can look after, say, I don't know, 100 patients at a given time because they're managing by exception. And there's also a benefit for the patient because who wants to go in the hospital? And the, the curves here, are the, the data points are about readmissions to the hospital. And the top one is uh, heart failure related. Uh, the bottom one is all cause. In both cases, you see about a 50% drop. So this is pretty common now in the marketplace. There's, there's reimbursement codes to support it. Um, and most uh, forward thinking um, healthcare delivery systems and practices are using something like this to manage this patient population. Uh, I'll mention these other two, again, very briefly. Uh, blood pressure, you know, these days, uh, and I'd be curious if anyone has stories about this, but most of the time, if you get diagnosed in the office with a high blood pressure reading, your doctor is gonna ask you to go home, purchase a cuff if you can afford it, measure your blood pressure in the home for a couple of weeks and send those readings in somehow. They might say, please bring them back to the office. That's possible. But with Bluetooth and other technologies, it's possible that you could just send it in. You could you could put it on a spreadsheet and share that spreadsheet over the patient portal. There's multiple ways to do it. The point is you're using a medical device outside of the office to better your health by doing this. And diabetes is pretty darn fascinating because the technology in diabetes now is it's very exciting. You have continuous glucose monitors. So the notion that you have to prick your finger four or five times a day, which is a noxious stimulus, is going away. People are getting continuous glucose monitoring. And more exciting than that, they're connecting them to insulin pumps to create what we would call an electronic artificial pancreas, where the consume, uh, sorry, the continuous glucose monitor uh, uh, informs the amount of insulin that's going through the insulin pump. So that's a true uh, chronic illness management wearables phenomenon that is in fairly widespread use in the marketplace. So I hope this has been useful for you. In summary, I would say if you're a person who identifies with numbers, wearables alone can be very helpful for you in achieving your goals. That's like if you're an accountant or you do spreadsheets or you really just love like I said, measuring something and then managing it. You'll be fine with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and you'll do well. If you don't though, and as I said, I think the majority of us fall in the second category, work with yourself, a loved one, a psychologist, someone else to think about what motivates you and find that app to pair your device with so that you can be motivated, whether it's, again, having a goblin chase you or giving to a charity or uh, getting you know loot loss aversion where you put money in and lose it. There's even another one where if you uh, don't achieve your goals, you have to give money to a charity that you despise. I think these are all very interesting. And if you have a chronic illness uh, condition rather or risk for atrial fibrillation, I would say ask your doctor about the potential for monitoring as a tool to help you. So thanks very much. These are my contact uh, information. You don't, if you want to get in touch with me, you don't have to scribble any of these down because again, the slides are going to be available. And I think I can stop sharing and um, and open it up for, for conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavidar. Um, we have some questions offline that um, came in earlier that I'd like to start hitting. Sure. Um, what are the top three metrics I should care about? So that that's tricky. I mean, you know, it, it may it may there may be some gender differences. There may be mm. some, uh, genetic differences. Uh, I mean, I, as I alluded to earlier, a, a little bit of physical activity goes a long way. So I'm a pretty passionate believer in that. I also mentioned sleep. I'm a pretty passionate believer that sleep and and then maybe just a diet. The the this isn't something you can track with an app, but something I love. Uh, I think it was Walt. Willard, who said uh, very famously, uh, eat um, 
Not too much, mostly plants. Yeah, I think it's eat real food. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, eat real food. Um, okay. Um, what about a smart scale uh, versus a DEXA scan? Or is that technology there yet? So I think that, yeah, it's a great question. I think the smart scales are, again, if, if you're motivated for that, um, they do pretty well with body fat ratio and some other things. Uh, the one I've used over the years is from Withings. I know there are many. Um, again, they're usually they're connected, so they'll give you a chart. They'll give you, and you can share it with a provider if if your provider is interested. Of course, the the medical application of the scale, which I mentioned, is mostly heart failure. Sometimes it's people that are uh, entering into these uh, uh, aggressive weight loss programs as well. Um, so I, I think they're fine. Uh, it all depends on um, what motivates you. I have to say, I've been tracking my weight for 15 years and it sort of slowly goes up. And I mean, that's just getting older, I guess. But I but I do pay attention to it and uh, I'm motivated to alter my my diet and activity based on, on those readings. Mm-hmm. Um, for, I know you're not a cardiologist by training, but um, what are the, what's the best choice if you're looking to track heart data? Well, so there's one called Cardia with a K. Um, again, I think that that is mostly for people who want to do rhythm strips. I, I think the Apple Watch is as good as any. Okay. And unless you're doing blood pressure, then of course you want to do a, a blood pressure uh, uh, cuff that's Bluetooth uh, enabled. Okay. Um, we have a question about steps per day. Um, how many to improve my heart health and how many to lose weight? Hmm. So that those are those are great questions and complicated. So um, I'll start by saying the 10,000 steps a day thing is just a myth. That doesn't mean you you should cut back on your activity. But and I use it as as a goal because it's a convenient goal, but it isn't. There's nothing, excuse me, magical about 10,000 steps. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I, I think, you know, getting out for, I, th I think maybe the better way to look at this is, uh, and I alluded to it in one of my stories, um, don't sit for more than an hour without getting up and walking around for five minutes and uh, try to get in 30 minutes of, of pretty um, fast walking if you can a day, if you can do that. Th those are probably better goals than counting steps. Um, although I go for a walk now tonight, I'm giving talking to you, but most nights by, I'm out walking at this point and, um, and enjoying a podcast or something. So, but yes, I think, um, more importantly now to lose weight, that's a different ball of wax because as we now know, especially with these new weight loss drugs, you know, we used to have a very kind of, um, primitive, I'll say primitive, at the time we didn't think so, but primitive view of calories in and calories out. And that just isn't right. Um, it, your own metabolism, the genetics behind how rapidly you burn fuel, all of that plays a role. And of course, for decades or maybe centuries, we, we ostracized people who were heavy, which is sad because most of the time people that are heavy are not heavy because they want to be. It's because they're genetics are pointing in a certain direction. So it's important to, an important part of weight loss is including activity as part of that and exercise and watching your diet and eating less uh, high caloric density foods and, and the like. But I, I, I wouldn't advise anyone to develop their weight loss program around just steps. I don't think that's wise. Is the, is the product Lumen considered a wearable app does it fall into this category that you're discussing tonight so i i only know a little bit about it i would say um i probably don't know enough to say definitively i believe yes the i think we're we're crossing over into the because what what happens is nowadays especially with um cern mobile apps are tracking you based on what's going on on your mobile device so then the, the wearable becomes the smartphone. 
but I don't know Lumen well, so I can't really comment. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's an auxiliary device that you use too. I'm, I don't know either, but I know it's, uh, it gets a lot of advertising space on my Instagram. There you go. <laughs> for weight loss. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, are you aware of the All of Us program with Fitbit? Man. Sure, I'm a member. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm part of it. Yeah, it's it's a government sponsored initiative. Um, maybe this is the wrong analogy, but I think of it as a modern day um, Framingham Heart Study type model. It's it's except it's millions of people, um, and there are centers. The Mass General Brigham has a big component of this in our own group, but there are centers around the country that are managing this. Um, I think when they started, it was envisioned that it would be a lot more device data than that they've actually been able to um, include. I mean, not not everyone has devices. We, we, we didn't really touch, and we can if you want, but on equity and diversity and uh, low income and so forth. There's There's pockets of the uh, of the country where people simply can't afford these things. So, but yeah, all of us is, is like this giant data dump includes genetic data includes you. If you've been a part of it, you know, you ask like a, you answer like a 50 question survey to be part of it. And they're using that as a tool to understand large populations, but also people are dipping into it to do research studies as well. Mm -hmm. Someone is mentioning that they were given a Fitbit through this program. Yes. Yeah. So I knew they did that for a while. I don't know how widespread that is. And again, mm -hmm. it's ironic. I mean, again, it's government money. So you take take or leave what you like with it. But I'll just say that I don't know the particular individual, but most people who are given a Fitbit from this thing, maybe tossed it in the drawer if they weren't motivated to use it. Yeah. Is, does it come with a tutorial or anything like that? I that, that you know, Fitbit has some basic stuff on their mat on their app and whatnot, but yeah. Um, someone asking, are you aware of any for-profit monitoring program? Uh, health professional watching for issues with heart patients. Uh I know more on the device side than the <clears throat> the service side. So I mentioned Cardia which is really a competitor to Apple Watch. Um, there's all the blood pressure cuffs, Omron, et cetera. Uh, I, and, and there are companies, there's a lot of them, uh, that will out, you know, allow your doctor to outsource monitoring of populations to the company. I don't know if that really answers the question or not, but, but they're out there. I, I, I think that's probably the best I can come up with on that. Okay. Um, I know we have at least one cardiologist in our audience. I don't know if he'd be prepared <laughs> to answer this question. What metrics are helpful for my cardiologist? I'll see if he responds in the Q&A. Um, uh, does anybody else have any other questions tonight? Let's see. Oh. Someone asks, um, recent studies show moderate exercise promoting mitochondria health. Do you see a carryover into heart health and benefits of diabetic monitoring? Well, I can't answer that admit, perhaps as scientifically as, as the, as the uh, uh, questioner worded it, but I, I can just revert back to the compelling data that I showed about small bursts of activity being really critical. I think it just keeps coming up over and over and over again that physical activity is helpful for all of these things. Um, and it certainly is known to be helpful for patients with diabetes. I, I would just hasten to add though, that just saying you have diabetes, you should be more active, almost sounds like we're, we're talking down at you. And, and that really shouldn't be the case. As I said uh, once or twice, Everyone has a life. Everyone has children or just other stuff that gets in the way of this. So I think the reason I shared the data I did about short bursts is, again, Duolingo, I mentioned, I, I mean, I do that. It's three minutes a day and I'm learning German right now. But you could do the same thing with physical. I say, I'm going to step up on a chair for a minute in the morning and a minute in the afternoon. That will make your 
chance of dying 50% less. It's quite extraordinary. And I think that's the way you have to view this. It's not a mountain to climb. Um, try to do something simple, easy, fits into your schedule. Again, make it about your life. That's good advice. Um, someone asking, how accurate do you think the Apple Watch measurements are? I know there well, are a lot yeah, of as, them. <laughs> yeah, as I said, they're, they're not terribly accurate. Um, but to me, that's that's not necessarily the um, the goal. Uh, you know, we we if we really wanted to measure uh, the calories expended, there's this thing called a bomb calorimeter where you you go inside of a device that looks like an iron lung. I mean, my my point is accuracy is is all a relative thing. They I would say this though that Apple Watch is internally consistent. So. You know, your your smartphone might say you did 7,000 steps. Your watch might say 9,000. Your Fitbit might say 9,500. Pick one and just follow it. And don't worry so much about the relative numbers, but the fact that you're using one thing and it's internally consistent day after day. Yeah, the trends are reliable, even if the data isn't, yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, I think that covers all the questions we got tonight. Um, throw some, oh. Here's one. Please yep. talk about crash detection and fall detection in the Apple Watch. Um, yeah, so that's controversial. Um, I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. I'm, others might disagree with me. Um, the, the crash detection thing, as, as I'm sure everyone knows, became very problematic for them because bump yourself like that and you know the thing goes off. I, I actually have a Garmin uh, watch. My children gave it to me. Um, and it has a similar feature. I'm out cycling, and uh, if I get off my bike suddenly, my wife gets a message that I've had an accident. She doesn't like that very much. So I think they're they're a little bit again, they need to be refined a bit uh, before before we bring them out for prime time. Thank you. I think that covers all the questions now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kavidar, for being with us tonight and sharing your insight onto this, in this interesting and ever-changing topic. I'd like to thank everybody that was behind the scenes helping make this webinar happen. Mm -hmm. um, also, I wanna thank the staff at Newton Wellesley Hospital who are working so hard to be um, an amazing resource to our community and they don't get thanked enough. So I'd like to take just a quick second to do that. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the presentation, the slides, and the resources will all be available to anyone who's registered for this um, webinar this evening. So you can look forward to getting that in the next few days. So thank you again, everyone who participated, and have a great evening. Thanks very much.